Hi, I'm Dr. David Atley. In this video, I'm going to use the Stellarium Web Simulator, which is a planetarium simulator, so <clears throat> which is a free planetarium simulator software available in the browser to work through a lab for Astronomy 101 at the Community College of Aurora. In this lab, I'll be using Stellarium Web to explore a little bit about how astronomers identify the positions of stars and how stars move over the course of a night. Let's get started. Okay, I've got everything set up. Okay, I've got everything set up for a location other than where I live. I've located Stellarium in Mexico City, well outside of Colorado, where this lab will take place. I've located Stellarium in Mexico City, which is far from Aurora, so the answers that I'll generate in this demonstration will not be the right answers for the lab that you're going to turn into me in class. But hopefully you'll still learn something useful. But what this will do is demonstrate how you'll use the interface to go through and answer all of the lab's questions. So let's go ahead and jump in. I'm going to skip past most of the introductory material at the beginning of the lab manual that you can see over here on the right. I encourage you to read through that. It's a summary of how astronomers measure positions and how the sky changes over a night. But we don't need to go over that in order to understand how I'm going to use the Stellarium interface. Um, so go ahead and read that on your own time before you start doing the lab yourself. <clears throat> before you start doing the lab yourself. Okay, so the first question, what is today's date? Um, you can see today's date for me across the bottom of Stellarium here but your own mileage will vary, so put in your own date whenever you're working on this lab. Once you've got a date, the next thing you need to do is to answer question number two, to figure out the time of sunset at this location. So what I'll do is pan over here to the west. You'll notice that I'm facing towards the north, that's the default when you start up Stellarium Web, and you'll also notice that it's after sunset. It's dark. Um, and Stellarium, by default, on the web will open up at nighttime. So you will see stars when you open up the display. But, through the magic of computers, I can go backwards in time until the sun's up. Hey, there's the sun. And now I can go forwards until the sun sets. So I'll Jump forward by an hour. Oh, okay, the sun is down, so I've gone too far. Let me back up a little bit and use the minute keys to move the sun down until it crosses the horizon. Okay, I'm going to say the sun is now down, and it is 1845. Stellarium displays times in 24-hour format. If you're unfamiliar with 24-hour time, how it works is that times in the afternoon or the evening have 12 plus the clock time that you see on the clock on your wall or on your computer clock. So, for example, 1845, that's 6.45 p.m. 12 plus 6 is 18. So I will come over here and record the time of sunset in Mexico City on September 9th as 6.45 p.m. Now, I can't see any stars yet. It's still too early. And I need stars in order to progress in the lab. So the next thing I have to do is to jump forward in time again. And the lab is telling me that I should jump forward by one and a half hours, one hour and 30 minutes. One and a half hours after 6.45 p.m. is going to be 8.15 p.m. 
So one hour gets me to 745, and then another half hour after that gets me to 815. Now, I paused Stellarium's clock before I started the lab demo. Normally, that won't happen. So when you open Stellarium Web, cl the clock will just continue to progress in real time. I'm going to unpause time now so that time will continue to march forward as normal through the rest of this demonstration. The next thing I'm going to do is pan around towards the south. You'll notice there's a big S right here, so Stellarium's telling me that I'm now facing approximately due south. And what I want is I want to find a bright star that's a little bit to the east of due south. I'm going to choose this star, Peacock. Uh, Peacock is not especially bright. Um, it's about magnitude 2, which is sort of in the middle of the brightness scale for stars that you normally can see from within a city. And uh, this is unfamiliar to me, actually. I've never seen this star. Um, I'm far enough south here in Mexico City that some of the stars towards the southern horizon are invisible from, say, Colorado or New York or Canada. Okay, so I've chosen my star. Now, the next thing I'm going to need to do is to enter its name and the current clock time according to Stellaria, which right now is about 8.17 p.m. So I'm going to observe Peacock. You will observe a different star because, as I said, Peacock is not going to be visible from Aurora. Just clean that up a little bit. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use this grid that I have turned on here to measure the position on the sky of Peacock, which, remember, is that bright star right there. This will be off by default when you turn on Stellarium. So this is how the sky will look when you first turn Stellarium on. I will turn my grid on by clicking this bullseye right here. And that turns on altitude and azimuth measures, or elevation and azimuth, as it's called in the lab. Elevation is the distance of an object above the horizon. So here's our horizon right there, that boundary between the ground and the sky. And as I move up, I'm going to cross these horizontal grid lines, which mark points of constant elevation. This grid line is plus 10 degrees, then plus 20, plus 30, etc. So Peacock is between 10 and 20 degrees, and I'm going to estimate visually and say that's probably about 13 degrees. Maybe it's 12, maybe it's 14, probably not 14, could be 12, but 13 is going to be good enough. I'm not looking for perfect answers here. I want you to use the grid system and give me your best measurement. Don't just look it up in the star display. And then I'll do the same thing for azimuth. Azimuth measures distance in degrees from due north. Due north is behind me, so we can't see it in this display. But the azimuth pointer starts due north, moves towards the east, so over here, to the left when I'm facing south, comes out, comes along, and as it crosses these vertical lines, azimuth is increasing. So this vertical line right here is a line of constant azimuth, which is labeled 135 degrees. This next vertical line is 150, then 165, 180, etc. So Peacock, my star, is between 165 and 180. I'm going to, again, estimate visually, and I'm going to say that's probably less than 170, maybe call that 168. That's my best guess. Now, I want a nice, bright, easily identified star because I'm going to come back to Peacock at the, towards the end of this demonstration and measure its position again and see how it's moved. 
if you choose a fainter or less easily identified star, you might have to work a little harder to find it again, but you can do that. The next thing that I need to do, according to my lab instructions, is find the North Star, Polaris. And the North Star, unsurprisingly, is to the north. So I'll turn around, figuratively speaking. I'll pan around using my mouse until I'm facing in my browser due north. And Polaris is a relatively bright star near zero degrees azimuth. You'll notice that the vertical line that runs through north is marked zero degrees here. So this is my line of zero degrees azimuth, and you'll find a relatively bright star pretty close to zero degrees. If I click on it, I can bring up its name, and yes, indeed, that's Polaris. So I'm looking at the right star. And what I want is its height above the horizon. So I'll start from zero degrees, that marker right there, that's 10, that's 20. Polaris is between 10 and 20 degrees. It's pretty close to 20. So I'm going to guess, uh, estimate that that's at maybe 18 degrees. Who knows, maybe it's 19, 18 and a half, but I'm gonna estimate 18. And so that's what I'll write down for the elevation of Polaris, 18 degrees. Number six, doesn't require you to use the interface at all, it requires you to use your brain. Number six says that Polaris would have an elevation of 90 degrees for an observer at 90 degrees latitude, and it would have an elevation of zero degrees for an observer at zero degrees latitude. Given that, you should use the elevation of Polaris that you will measure to estimate the latitude of Denver. So essentially, what you must do is find a pattern, given those two examples, and then fit Denver into the pattern. Use that pattern to figure out what Denver's latitude ought to be, given your measurement in number five. Once you've done that, we're going to move on to the next section, which will be looking at constellations. I'm going to temporarily remove the coordinate grid and instead turn on my constellation markers. That's this triangle right here. That brings up the names and outlines of the constellations that are visible in this display. The lab asks you to draw two constellations, Ursa Minor, this one right here, and Cassiopeia, which is visible here. I'm not going to do that, just in the interests of time. As you do your drawing, a couple things to keep in mind is that I would like to see the correct orientation. So when you sketch in Ursa Minor over here, it should come up and kind of go like that. Cassiopeia should be sort of a sideways W over here, and try to get the relative sizes about right. One final thing to note, that's Polaris. So Polaris is at the end of Ursa Minor. So when you draw Ursa Minor into your paper, it should connect to Polaris here in the middle of that space. Once you've finished your drawing, we're going to look for the moon and for planets and see which constellations they can be found in. To do that, I'll turn back around to the south. For observers in the northern hemisphere, the moon and the planets are always found somewhere in the southern sky, so they're found more or less to the south of the observer and not to the north. And just to make life a little bit easier, I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I can see more of the sky. 
And do I see the moon? I do not see the moon. Oh, wait, there it is. There's the moon hiding right over there. So is the moon visible? Yes, it is. And right now, the moon is in the constellation of Virgo. Virgo is one of the 13 constellations of the zodiac, which means that the ecliptic passes through the constellation Virgo, along with Libra and Sagittarius and the one nobody remembers, which is Ophiuchus right here. So I will make a note and say yes, that Virgo is in the zodiac. What about planets? Are any of the planets visible? Answer, yes. That's Venus. And here's Saturn and Jupiter. So there are three planets visible right now. And I'll write them down. I'm not going to do all three, but I'll just say, um, for example, Venus is in, I think, Virgo. Yes, Venus is also in the constellation Virgo. And these planets will move relative to these constellations. So they're not part of the constellation official, officially. They're going to move into and out of these constellations as they travel along their orbits around the sun and therefore shift positions relative to the background stars. We'll discuss that in class when we talk about planetary motion and the geocentric solar system. Now, my next job, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit, is going to be to identify eight other constellations besides Cassiopeia and Ursa Minor and list them in this table. So, for example, uh, Scorpius. Scorpius has at least six member stars for sure. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, it passes. So I can write down Scorpius. And Scorpius is part of the zodiac. So I'm going to put an X. I could put a check mark in, but it's a pain to find a check mark in Word when I have it this small. If you're writing this by hand, you can put a check mark. You could also put an X, whatever, as long as it's clear that you're marking the constellations that belong to the zodiac. And then I'll pick one of these eight constellations that I'll write down and see if I can find any interesting objects within it. So I'll pick one more constellation and say Sagittarius. The next thing that you'll do is pick a constellation and sketch it. So again, I'm going to choose Sagittarius there's space at the end of the lab to sketch your constellation. So I'm going to sketch Sagittarius, but I'm not really going to draw it. When you do your sketch, a couple things to keep in mind. First, make sure that you're preserving relative scale and also relative brightness of stars. So that star, for example, is considerably brighter than that one and that's why it's shown bigger. So represent the brightness of the stars with the size of the dots that you draw. And only draw in the dots themselves. There's no need to draw in these lines. You can skip the lines, only draw the dots. Once you've done that, you'll pick an interesting object in your constellation and do some research about it. You could skip this and come back to it at the end. I'm going to choose an object now just so you can see what I mean. So I'll open up a new browser window and I'll search for, say, interesting objects or famous objects 
in the constellation Sagittarius. Let's see what comes up. Okay, so we get a summer. And you can hunt around deep sky objects in Sagittarius. That might be a good link. That's going to find you some fainter things that might be a little bit more interesting than just single stars. Once you've chosen an object, say Caus Australis or Epsilon Sagittarii, you'll write a paragraph about your object being sure to cite your sources. So make sure that when you write your paragraph, you record the URL or web address of any sources that you use in doing your research. And then just write those down. Don't worry about APA format or anything like that. Just make sure to write down the URL of the websites you use and you'll be in good shape. Okay, let's go back to Stellarium and carry on. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to return to our star that we looked at towards the beginning of the lab. So I need to find Peacock again. I'm going to turn off my constellation labels again, and turn back on my coordinate grid, and I'm guessing that's Peacock. Hey, I got the right star, that's great. So I'm going to record its position again. I'm going to measure it using that coordinate grid. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So Peacock now is at about, call that 12 degrees elevation. And its azimuth is, say, 170. It looks like it's about one third of the way between 165, this line here, and 180 that line there. So we'll call that 170. Again, not perfect, but good enough. And then I'll record the time from Stellarium's internal clock, which currently is 8.32 p.m. The next thing that I'll do is figure out how much my star moved. Did my star move? Yes, it did. I'm pretty sure that it moved up a little bit and west a little bit. If I don't remember for sure, I can always check my earlier measurements. So what I'm seeing is elevation appears to be about the same. I'm, I met, estimated 13 before and I estimated 12 this time. So maybe it went down a little bit, maybe it stayed the same and it's gone from 168 to 170. So did the star move? The star moved down and right, west. What is the difference in elevation and azimuth? Now, change in elevation is the final value, 170, minus the initial value, 168, which is two. Change, whoops, that was azimuth, okay. See, I make mistakes too. Change in elevation is the final value, 12, minus the initial value, 13, so negative one. Using the Pythagorean theorem to add those together, says this. Imagine that we measured the position of this star using, or the motion of this star using a horizontal shift and a vertical shift. Well, the star didn't go along those legs there, it just took a straight line like that. So what we're interested in is this length here. But what we measured is A and B, the horizontal and the vertical motion. So we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem plus those two measurements to work out the length of the hypotenuse of this right triangle 
C. And I'll let you remind yourself of what the Pythagorean theorem says and work out how to do that on your own. Once you've got a total motion, in this case, I'm just going to assume that it's three degrees, just for the sake of argument. Then we'll look at how much time passed between my observations. From 8.32 at the end and 8.17 at the beginning, that is 15 minutes. So 15 minutes passed and the star moved an estimated three degrees. Is that consistent with the expectation of 15 degrees per hour? So to answer that question, I'll say, if the star moved three degrees in 15 minutes in one hour, which is four times 15 minutes, it should have moved 12 degrees, which is a little bit slower than expected, but given the limits of my position measurements, that's probably consistent. Now I'm going to pan back north again, and I'm going to find Ursa Major, excuse me, Ursa Minor, one last time. So here's Ursa Minor again, and I will advance the time, one hour at a time, until sunrise and see if Ursa Minor ever dips below the horizon. So it hid behind that tree there for a minute, but it still stayed up above the horizon, above the boundary between the ground and the sky. So in Mexico City, Ursa Minor never goes below the horizon, at least on this date. So the answer here would be no, it didn't. And then I will advance my date two months. So I'll go from September to November. And then I will back up to the time of sunset. Okay, I've gone too far. That's fine. Okay, sunset's about there. Now I'll progress forward again until dawn and see if Ursa Minor sets in November. Okay, again, hiding behind the tree, but still up. Okay, and there's sunrise. So no, Ursa Minor does not set in Mexico City in November either. So I would again say no. So Ursa Minor is a constellation that stays in the sky and doesn't go below the horizon. And we have a special name for those types of constellations. So the last thing that you should write as your answer to number 16 is the name that we give to constellations that remain in the sky and that never set. I'll let you figure that out for yourself. So that's my quick walkthrough for how to answer the questions in the Exploring the Sky with Stellarium Lab using Stellarium Web. I hope you found this demonstration to be helpful. If you get stuck, 
please come talk to me or, or shoot me an email. I'll be happy to help walk you through the process. Good luck, and I'll see you in class.